Good morning and welcome to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Professional Webinar Series. My name is Jen Marvin. I'm sitting in today for Claire Lewis and Tom Wickman. Today's webinar is Turf and Landscape Disease Update with Dr. Phil Harmon. This webinar is approved for one FNGLA, Florida Water Star, LIAF, DBPR LA, and FDAC CEU. There is a $10 administration fee to receive the certificate for continuing education. This is a part of a monthly webinar series held on the second Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. Our next webinar is Residential Landscape Management with Dr. A.J. Reisinger. Your microphones have been muted. Please put your questions in the chat box and we will take them at the end of the presentation. Also, you will see a survey invitation pop up. Please take a moment to fill this out as it really helps us determine what educational programs to offer. And we are currently looking at this next year's lineup. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Phil Harmon. Uh, Philip F. Harmon is a professor of plant pathology and, and an extension specialist. He received his undergraduate and doctoral degrees from Purdue University. His research interests include diseases of warm season turf grasses or turf grass species and disease management for Southern highbush blueberry. In addition to providing efficient and effective disease management strategies for clientele, additional research goals include selection of turf grass and blueberry disease resistance in collaboration with plant breeding programs. His extension efforts have focused on providing rapid and accurate diagnostic services to the turf grass, small fruits, and ornamental plant industries. Recommendations given as part of diagnostic services include practical, research-based disease management solutions. He has served as an assigning editor for plant disease management reports and as an associate editor of applied turf grass science. Today, Dr. Harmon is providing a landscape disease update. It's my pleasure to turn the floor over to Dr. Phil Harmon. Thank you, Jen. Thank you for the uh, introduction and, and for the You're invitation welcome. today. Um, very nice to be here to speak about turf and ornamental disease update. Um, I have a, a lot of slides to go through today. I'm gonna kind of go through three different topic areas fairly quickly. Uh, I'm gonna pause at the end of each of those topic areas for a couple of questions to be read from the from the Q&A session. Um, if you have questions of clarification as we go along, please go ahead and ask those. And I've asked Jen to stop me and we can get some clarification there. Uh, so since I'll be going through fairly quickly, uh, we'll also have time at the end to revisit some of these slides on management in particular data that I'm, I'm going to show. But I wanna get through these three topic areas because they are important for us, um, things that we're seeing right now in uh, the lawn and landscape and, and turf disease issues in particular. We can have some time at the end for ornamental and landscape uh, plant uh, disease questions as well, but today I'll focus primarily on, on turf grass. And the three topic areas that I wanted to cover include a new and very troublesome disease in South Florida, primarily from Pinellas down through the Keys, that's caused by a virus. It's a mosaic disease and it's causing a new symptom we're calling lethal viral necrosis. This is a, a major issue because it kills four tam lawns, four tam being one of the more popular lawn grasses that we manage in Florida. And it can be confused for a lot of other diseases and unnecessary pesticides can be applied uh, in, in futile attempts to, to bring lawns back when they have this viral disease. So I'll talk about that. It does seem to be moving, spreading further north as time goes on. Um, so we'll talk about that and then answer some questions there. And then two of our perennial problems with turf grass in, in the state of Florida include take all root rot and large patch disease. Large patch um, is occurring right now. Take all root rot is typically a spring, summer, and fall disease uh, that can cause a lot of issues for us, management issues for our turf grass and, and Florida lawns. So uh, we'll cover those three topic areas today. I want to start with a little bit of an introduction into why diagnostics are so important and what diagnosing plant disease means. Um, and, then, uh, and then we'll go from there. So uh, the diagnosis of plant diseases is very important for us to be able to come up with an efficient management strategy for diseases that we deal with, whether we're talking about turf, palms, or other ornamentals in our landscapes. 
And as landscape professionals, you know that there are some diseases that are common. There are some diseases that you look at, scratch your head and say, you know, I've never seen this before. And there's a lot of in-between and overlapping symptoms that can occur to make it difficult for us to, to correctly, accurately diagnose what the problem is that we're trying to manage. Without knowing what that problem is, uh, we can have some very difficult times in trying to assess and employ management strategies. In fact, some management strategies for one disease can make a second disease, uh, if you've misdiagnosed it, worse. So it's important for us to know what that is. And it's different than identifying an insect pest or identifying a pathogen. A diagnosis is an association of a pathogen with a known susceptible host within the environment that's favorable for disease to occur. So we'll talk a little bit about that as we move forward and, and why it's important. Most of the turf diseases that we deal with, with the exception being the first one I'm going to talk about today, but most of the turf diseases we deal with are caused by fungi. That applies to ornamental plants as well. Uh, fungi are very common plant pathogens, bacteria, less so phytoplasmas, uh, kind of fit into that bacterial category, major issue for us on palms, uh, and then viruses. We have the most management option tools available for fungal diseases of plants. Um, we'll focus there on the second two parts of the uh, talk on some of those management options and how to avoid disease in the first place. And then there are others that can cause disease like parasitic alga and plants. Uh, that we'll not cover today, but that are good to keep in mind. They can be, um, can throw a monkey wrench into diagnosing what a plant problem is. Another thing to say here is that it's rarely just one issue that's causing us problems. So how do you know? How do you know what the problem is that you're dealing with? How do you know what the best management practices are going to be for that particular disease or problem? Short answer is you send a, a sample into a diagnostic clinic. There are several diagnostic clinics within the state of Florida within the IFAS system. The one that I'm most closely associated with is here in Gainesville, the Plant Diagnostic Center. This is an impressive lab. It's a lab that's a hub resource for the, the whole United States. It's one of five resource labs uh, within the country. We are the Southeast Hub Lab, and uh, we do samples when others can't. So for the uh, coronavirus pandemic, our doors have been open the whole time, processing samples for our neighbors, neighboring states like Georgia, whose, whose labs had closed. Um, it's a building that was, that was put up in 2012. Very nice facility. If you get the chance, drop a sample off or give us a shout and we'll arrange a tour for you. It's, it's a nice um, building and, and place to work. And we do some really good work there at the Plant Diagnostic Center. It's an ISO-based accredited lab. We have uh, quality assurance and control protocols in place and accreditation that ensures that we're giving a, a good diagnosis out for those samples that we receive. If you take a look at the top picture here, this is the general complement of, of students, staff, and, and faculty that work at the Plant Diagnostic Center, at least pre-COVID. During COVID, we went down to four people working in shifts. Um, and so uh, now we're starting to build back with our students and, and, uh, and staff. We do about 3,000 samples in a normal year. Um, and there are two services, a rapid turf grass diagnostic service and general service. And our fees range from $40 to $75 for a sample. And that is basically a copay for some of the expense of time of the people working on that sample, breaking it down, plating it, materials needed to make the media, to, to incubate, to look at the sample under the microscope and make that diagnosis. The recommendations that we, uh, that we include with our diagnoses come from Florida Research when it's available, and our turnaround time is about two to seven days. So it's important for our clientele to understand that we can't look at a disease in the field and accurately or with any kind of confidence diagnose disease issues. We have to send that in, coax the pathogen out in the lab, identify it, and then look at the symptoms and diagnose the disease on the plant that we're interested in. This service is available in the Plant Diagnostic Center, but also in other labs in Trek and Quincy around the state of Florida. And so we encourage you to use the lab close to you that you're familiar with. And these services are offered to everyone in the state of Florida uh, in our Plant Diagnostic Center. It's also a global resource. We have permitting uh, and containment available to receive samples globally. Although we focus on Florida first and our Florida lawn and landscape, as well as agricultural commodities, uh, take top priority. 
what do we do with the sample? Very briefly, we take the sample and, and triage and we look at what the host is, what the potential problems are, what the symptoms that have been described to us, and then also show in the sim sample that's been received. And then we look for signs of a pathogen, signs of parts of a pathogen that we can see. Sometimes that's fuzzy mycelium or furry spores or slimy growth. Uh, we look for what we can find of the pathogen evidence. Usually there isn't any, and we have to incubate that sample, plate that sample on, on specialized media to be able to get it, that pathogen to grow out. In the case of bacteria and some uh, viruses and some bacteria, we never see signs of the pathogen. We have to rely on symptoms and other tests like molecular tests and, and uh, immunological tests. So symptoms are noted during triage um, and which plant part, what's been included with the sample as far as information. And uh, symptomatic turf plants are, are selected and plated if we're talking about ornamental plants, maybe leaves or stems or roots, depending on where we see the symptom and what the problem is that's been, uh, that's been explained to us and, and sent in as far as additional information. We also use a moist chamber. This is something we can do in the office or in the field. That's basically a Ziploc bag with some moist paper towel that encourages fungal growth and encourages bacterial growth. And sometimes we'll reveal the pathogen out of a diagnostic sample for us, um, even better than our, our media can do. In conjunction with the media, we look at these and then associate those symptoms with the plant, the known pathogens that affect it, and make a diagnosis. What are some of the appropriate disease samples that we like to see? It depends on what kind of problem we're dealing with as to what we need to make a good diagnosis. In general, these are like generalized rules for what we'd like to see as far as leaf spots or foliar blights. We need leaves still attached to the stem so they don't dry out. When plant samples dry out, the pathogens that they contain will also die in some cases and make it impossible for us to know what eventually or essentially caused the problem in the first place. So as far as wilt diseases go, this can be really tough with a big plant because we prefer to have the whole plant. When we're talking about a 30-foot tall ligustrum or 50-foot tall palm tree, that's not possible. And so um, the whole plant, when we, when we can get it, is important for us to be able to look from root to tip for the pathogen. The pathogen may not always be where we see the symptoms showing up. It may be affecting the plant below ground or in another part. So this is where photos and phone calls make a big difference. Get to know the diagnostic lab that you use as part of your business. Give them a call, send them pictures, and we'd be happy to advise you on what it might be, what some of the best ways to sample those plants are, and then um, advise you along the way of the diagnostic process to figure out what's going on and what's the best uh, way to manage it. Viral diseases, we need new symptomatic tissues. If we have viral issues that have been on the plant for a long time, those uh, viruses can, can go away. They can be lost, um, not detectable, but uh, still have symptoms showing. So new symptomatic tissue is best there. And uh, again, with mature trees or palms, always send a photo, phone call first, and then maybe we need sawdust or a branch or a particular fungal conch or something that's growing out of it. So uh, it's, it's critically important for us to receive clear information on the site as well as the symptom and the, the progression of the disease problem uh, that you've noted as you've been uh, interacting with these plants in the landscape. That can tell us a lot about the story of how the disease developed and uh, what it might likely be now or have been caused by uh, initially. Uh, for a point of reference, you know, we have other resource labs and services within UF IFAS to, uh, to note. We have a one-stop uh, IFAS Diagnostic Services website here. You see these blue boxes. You can click on them. That will take you to plant diagnostic clinics, insect ID services, the nematode assay lab, soil testing, et cetera. That's available um, there in, in EDIS. It's linked through the EDIS system. It's also on the IFAS extension webpage. You can scan that QR code there. It'll take you straight to it. And it's something we've been putting on some of our literature. Uh, again, just to get folks in to be able to find their extension resource and easily determine what services are available and what might be most appropriate to help with a plant uh, manage plant disease issue or plant problem in the landscape. As far as samples, this is a course plot of samples through time. Uh, the uh, red bars are the general non-turf samples. Uh, you see we get 1,500 to 1,800 samples that are not turf, and then about a 300 or so samples that, uh, that are turf and the general side. We also have a turf-specific service called the Rapid Turf Diag Diagnostic Service, and we do 
approximately eight, 900 samples a year through that service as well. So well over 2,000, usually approaching uh, 3,000 samples per year are processed through the lab. The majority of those come from Florida and about half of them are turf grass. Um, a lot of the others are landscape ornamentals, including palms, and then vegetables and other agronomic crops, including small fruits, make up the, the balance. Okay, I'm gonna quickly move through here some uh, basic review of plant pathology. When we're talking about making a diagnosis, we have to uh, consider what a plant disease is. And it's not just an injury, it's not just a, uh, an insect pest or a, a fungus eating a plant, it's an interaction between a, a host, a pathogen, and environmental conditions that allow that pathogen to infect and cause disease on the host. We represent that, that uh, with a triangle, and the disease triangle here uh, helps us to visualize what the likelihood of disease is, what the likelihood of severe disease is, based on the lengths of the sides of those triangles. The more susceptible a host is, the larger that side of the triangle becomes, the more likelihood that we have disease will occur and will be severe. And the same thing applies to the pathogen, if it's present, if it's virulent, uh, it makes that side bigger and then the environment. In general, diseases are favored by wet, humid, moist conditions that are hot, and Florida has plenty of those. So we see a lot of, uh, a lot of disease in turf grass as well as the landscape here in Florida. Okay, I'm going to switch gears now and uh, get into the three diseases that I wanted to cover as far as disease updates for turf in Florida. The first is a viral disease. Now, viral diseases are not particularly common in turf grass. Prior to this lethal viral necrosis outbreak that started to occur in around 2013, really there was only one disease called mosaic. It was associated with sugarcane mosaic virus, and it was a very mild disease that uh, occurred in, in extreme South Florida and Palm Beach County uh, in association with sugarcane production. Sugarcane mosaic virus is the virus that causes mosaic in St. Augustine grass. It also infects sugarcane and other grasses. It's a podiviridae group, a podivirus. Um, that means it can be transmitted in sap, it can be transmitted by aphids, and it can also, in addition to St. Augustine grass we're gonna talk about today and sugarcane, it can also infect Bermuda grass, some past palums, crabgrass, some fountain grasses, and, and other various grass crops as well. So corn, uh, sugarcane, as I mentioned. Um, so this has not been historically since the 50s when it was identified a particularly problematic disease. It's been one that's been out there, uh, but not, not very um, serious as far as economic or, or um, losses in the landscape. And, and prim primarily this was observed in ditch banks around rural parts of Palm Beach County. Up until 2013, the symptoms of mosaic that we see, you really have to get down on your hands and knees and look for these sometimes. And so pathologists know that this virus was out there since the 1950s, causing these broken yellow streaks of yellow growth on St. Augustine grass leaf blades. This is different than the um, type of yellow you would see from nutrient deficiency. This is due to mosaic caused by sugarcane mosaic virus. Here's another look at the mosaic symptoms. Mosaic look different on dicots, on some of our ornamental plants. When we're talking about a grass, we see broken lines, we see blotchiness of yellow on a dark green background. And that is the extent to which mosaic affects St. Augustine grass in the landscape up until again about 2013. If we take that into the lab or the greenhouse and grow it out, we see that this virus is systemic and infects moves through the roots and stolons. It can be spread from one plant to the next by mowers or by sap. And then this is the kind of, of most severe mosaic symptom that we're gonna see. Again, not on the entire lawn or entire area of grass that's growing, but on a few sprigs here and there, um, the virus may be more uh, prevalent, but the symptom is gonna be generally mild. And it's gonna look like this and eventually turn the grass yellow. The symptoms become a little more severe when the turf is stressed. Uh, and can go from just a few little yellow streaks to primarily yellow. So in the 1960s, the symptom was described and published, and later it was associated with the virus and published and shown that that sugarcane mosaic virus and the podivirus group was causing that. And the symptoms that were described then in my predecessor's extension publications included a slight yellowing of turf, um, and uh, that was about it. It was never 
described as causing, uh, as causing necrosis or death of turf grass or particularly problematic outbreaks. In 2013, that changed whenever necrosis and plant death was reported in Pinellas County and also in Palm Beach County. The new symptoms that we saw and the samples that were submitted uh, were different than the conventional mosaic that we'd seen for the last 50 or 60 years. So uh, the, the difference was that the plants at the first cool weather in the fall started to die. They started to get um, uh, necrosis or browning. And then that browning quickly spread through the stolons and eventually killed lawns that were of the Floritam St. Augustine grass variety. So this is concerning because it, initially this disease was, was uh, misdiagnosed as fungal disease issues, which also occurred in the lawn at the same time. And a lot of fungicide were used in some high-end communities and lawns to try to save this grass that was actually affected by a viral disease. So in the cool temperature periods in about October and November in uh, Pinellas and Palm Beach counties, the mosaic that I showed earlier, the yellowing of leaf blades, went from that yellowing to the browning and necrosis that you see in this picture here. So these cells are dying. This is the distribution of the virus, similar to what we saw with the yellowing earlier, but now the virus has activated something within the plant that causes it to kill its own cells. That spreads systemically through the turf stolons to every piece of turf that's been infected, and then that turf will eventually uh, die. So the older leaves are first to be uh, affected with the lethal viral necrosis. The browning is what gives it away as, as not just mosaic. You'll see it on the leaf sheets. You'll see it on the stolons as well. And it will progress as the, as the first cool evening temperatures occur through the winter period. And then the grass will start to recover a little bit um, in, the, uh, in the spring of the year as warmer temperatures and better growing conditions come back. It can be fairly uh, drastic, the change from the yellow to the, to the brown and death and necrosis. Here's a, a picture where um, some of the, the yellow lesions have turned brown. Again, this only occurs so far on the Floritam variety of St. Augustine grass, but Floritam makes up somewhere around 80 plus percent of the lawns that we manage in Florida. So it's a very important issue for us because we have very few management options. We have a virus that can kill one of the most popular lawn grasses, and uh, it also looks like some fungal diseases, which can lead folks to use a lot of pesticides, fertilizers unnecessary to try to get lawns back that are doomed basically by this viral disease. Here we see the virus progressing as the, the winter goes on. And from one year to the next, the severity tends to increase in a particular yard that's affected. Once the lawn has been infected, the Floritam there will continue to harbor the virus. And uh, we see that the severity increases from year one to year three to approximately 90% of the turf of uh, that turf is Floritam dying uh, in that fall of the, the subsequent years. So by year three, we have a real problem on our hands where uh, we have grass that's dying and thinning and not, not presenting an acceptable lawn for, uh, for homeowners. If we put Floritam sod back over these lawns that have died, even if we use glyphosate or some other non-selective herbicide and do a good job of, of uh, site preparation and trying to remove as much turf as possible before resodding, if we put Floritam back in that that lethal viral necrosis affected lawn, we'll see that, that grass will die again much more rapidly this time. The new sod will become infected despite our best efforts to try to clean that lawn up. So in addition to recognizing the disease issue, it's important for us on resodding of the failed lawns not to use the Floritam genotype because it'll fail again and then result in us having to resod a second and third time if we don't recognize what's going on and select another genotype, cultivar of St. Augustine grass. This is a picture from Pinellas County where a lawn was resodded with Floritam. Uh, one pallet was a different variety in the center here. And so this is the third installation of sod. This area stuck because it was not Floritam. It has the virus in the center there. It's yellowing slightly, but the homeowner wanted to know why the rest of the lawn didn't look like this. The new Floritam sod uh, had died. And so we have not found a way to be able to successfully use Floritam sod after infection has been confirmed. And as you kind of see in this picture, it spreads down some of these communities where we have Floritam lawn touching Floritam lawn. 
to eliminate the grass and cause some real headaches, not just for individual homeowners, but for communities of, of homeowners within uh, these affected areas. Now, again, this is not uniformly distributed through the state. This is a neighborhood to neighborhood, community to community issue. Where it occurs is very severe, but it's sporadic and luckily not, um, not equally distributed through the entire state. This shows some of the grass that's dying. It has this bronzed, almost uh, uh, bronze yellow discoloration. You see weedy grasses like Bermuda grass have come in here. This is the second year that this, this lawn's been affected. There is some St. Augustine grass that remains. It's Floritan. It gets missed by the virus. About 1% to 3% of an affected lawn will survive. Weeds will come in. It'll start to grow a little bit that, that second year. And then it will die again down to, to 97 or so percent of Floritam, um, again, showing symptoms and dying in that subsequent year. So it keeps getting worse. It spreads from lawn to lawn. And there are not a lot of good options for us for what to do about it. The virus does infect the, the Bermuda grass. It doesn't kill it, unfortunately. Um, it causes uh, a very mild yellowing, but also then that Bermuda grass serves as a host reservoir for the virus as we move from year to year. Even if we get rid of all of the St. Augustine grass stolons, um, we'll still see that virus come back. We haven't been able to eliminate it from the neighbor's yards, but also from the propagules of turf that are, and weeds that are left behind. So this is a new thing, relatively new in the world of, of uh, research. 2013 is the first time we saw it. We've done quite a bit of work to try to determine what was causing it. We've shown it's sugarcane mosaic virus. It is um, not a formal published disease name as far as when I refer to lethal viral necrosis. It's a new symptom associated with a disease um, that's not known to cause that, that problem. And I stress that because it means that we don't know a lot about this. We don't have all of the answers as far as the research goes. We are um, pursuing research. We are doing that to try to understand better and come up with other management options. Um, but so far, 100% of the samples that we've seen with lethal viral necrosis have tested positive for sugarcane mosaic virus. Um, and that is the virus that causes the issue. Why it started causing this issue in 2013, 60 years after it was first uh, observed and, and uh, 40 years after the introduction of a very good long grass floritam, we don't know why, but we know it's out there and it's causing some real issues for some of our, um, some of our communities. So kind of as a lethal viral necrosis distribution, the sugarcane mosaic virus that causes it is distributed through the entire state of Florida. Lethal viral necrosis, the problem that we're talking about today that kills floritam is limited to Pinellas, to the west uh, coast of Florida from Naples down around through the Keys, and then from Vero Beach down, uh, again, through the Keys, through Miami-Dade. Those are the areas that we see it, again, not in every community, but um, where we see lethal viral necrosis and the sugarcane mosaic virus. This uh, outbreak in 2013 um, had been going for a few years before it was recognized and sent in. 2014 was the first year we saw it in Palm Beach County. In Palm Beach County, it spread more quickly north and south. And Pinellas County has spread throughout the county. It's killing thousands of lawns now in Pinellas, but it is um, not spreading over to Hillsboro particularly quickly. I had reports that it is in Hillsboro now, um, but that's been much slower than on the, the east coast of Florida. So within the last year, it's reached Glades County and, and uh, Collier County, and uh, we have reports and, and confirmed samples in Fort Myers as well. Uh, we have, again, Clay and Columbia County in the northern part of the state, positives for sugarcane mosaic virus, but the symptoms were of mosaic on um, centipede grass in one case and St. Augustine grass in the other, and not symptoms of lethal viral necrosis. So the new issue is primarily a problem in South Florida, and again, causes death of Floritam St. Augustine grass. So here is a, a map of where we've seen it up here. This is mosaic down in the southern part of Florida, it spread from 2013 down around through Fort Myers and then primarily within the county of Pinellas. As far as diagnostic tools that we use, we look for symptoms. We look whether that symptom is mosaic or if it's necro necrotic. During the summer months, the turf that's affected with LVN will start to um, again, 1% to 3% will survive. It will eventually become infected. It'll show mosaic symptoms through the summer that are indistinguishable from mosaic and other varieties. 
in that cool period that necrosis will occur. And then we'll see um, the um, we'll see the LVN come in and, and kill the turf. We detect the sugarcane mosaic virus, virus particles using an ELISA, which is an immunological test that we use antibodies to determine if we have the virus present in the sample. Um, and that's denoted here in this picture by the yellow color on the ELISA plate. So these are different diagnostic samples. This one was negative. You see the solution remained clear. Here we have positives like our positive control. Uh, that indicates the virus is present in that turf material that's submitted. It needs to be turf material that's, that's alive and then has uh, recently started to develop symptoms on the edge of the patch or the affected area. Of course, to reliably detect that, um, that pathogen. Let's talk about very briefly some of the research that we've done to show that this is a, a problem caused by sugarcane mosaic virus and that it is an issue specific to Floratam and very, very closely related varieties to Floratam. What we did was to isolate the virus and we transferred it into corn or maize, grew it up and then inoculated St. Augustine grass with the virus, different varieties, including Floratam from multiple farms, sod farms, and, uh, and then tried to recreate the symptoms that we were seeing in the field. When we put these plants in the greenhouse, they didn't die. They developed mosaic, but they were warm. They were fairly happy. When we put them in a cool temperature incubator and brought the temperature down to 65 degrees Fahrenheit, we saw that varieties that were not Floratam would continue to produce the mosaic symptom that we see in the field. Floratam varieties turned necrotic and died. So there's a cold temperature trigger. There are other stress triggers as well that can result in this transition from mosaic to lethal viral necrosis. This is the symptom that we got in the inoculated plants. And again, it matches very closely what we saw in the field and the timing of, uh, and the uh, low temperature exposure fits there as well. So we started to do some additional testing, looking for options for uh, recommendations for what to do. And we found that we had Floratam from three different farms that uh, was donated. None of it had sugarcane mosaic virus. In fact, we haven't found this virus on any sod farm to date. We have um, uh, found it in many landscapes. We've been working with sod producers and doing some survey work processing samples, but it appears to be a landscape issue. Again, we don't know where it came from, but right now we haven't seen a sod source for the spread of this virus. We think it's being spread by those aphids and then on mowers as well. Uh, as far as the Floratam inoculations go, three different farms submitted Floratam sod and two of them died and one of them didn't, which threw a whole monkey wrench into our hypothesis that this was a Floratam specific problem. The sample that we had from Pinellas was Floratam and, and it was mosaic. We collected it in the summer. We exposed it to 64 degrees Fahrenheit. It turned necrotic, just like we see in the field. None of the other varieties we tested from Bitter Blue down through Seville um, developed the, the necrotic symptoms. And so installing a different genotype of St. Augustine grass was one of the management recommendations that first came to mind and that we're still recommending. The issue of why that third Floratam didn't die was uh, the subject of additional research. So um, what we ended up finding out was we needed to do additional research with Dr. Kevin Kenworthy, our turf grass breeder, and looking at some of the genetic purities or genetic makeups of the sod products that were on the market. And what we found was that because these sod products are vegetatively propagated, they are in fact many times mixtures of genotypes of grasses not just a single genotype as you might expect when you buy Floratam sod, sometimes it includes other genotypes besides the true Floratam genetics that were released in the 70s. So there are some challenges with variety genetic purity that, that was subject of additional research again by Dr. Kevin Kenworthy and uh, it in, involves some additional samples. Um, because what happened was we started to recommend sod other than Floratam, sod was being installed and in some rare cases we saw the reports come back that I installed something other than Floratam, bitter blue for instance, and my lawn died. Why is that? We went out to Boynton Beach where we were seeing some of these uh, occurrences and sampled Valencia Lakes and Valencia Isles were two communities in particular that were first hit in Palm Beach County and, and hard hit hard as far as many lawns lost. 47 samples were collected in 2020 and uh, 33 individual stolen from those lawns that were supposed to have been grasses other than Floratam were uh, sampled and genotyped by Dr. Kenworthy 
And uh, the sample has had either LVN symptoms, mosaic symptoms, or some of them were asymptomatic, but we genotyped them to see what was going on. Was our recommendation not working because there was a virus mutation and now some of these other varieties were dying? Or was it a case of sod that was purchased and marketed and represented as something other than Floratam was actually Floratam? And uh, what we found was, was that in 29 lawns reported to be bitter blue by the folks that installed them, citra blue, palmetto, and then seven unknowns. When we genotyped those, all of the LVN symptoms samples were in fact Floratam. They had been sold and, and believed to be bitter blue by the installers, but they were actually Floratam. All of the mosaic samples uh, were other varieties. And so the, the recommendation held true, but the problem was that it was very difficult and impossible for us to know what the actual genetics of sod products are in some sod uh, fields and farms. So that introduced some wrinkles. Um, we had additional virus questions about whether or not there was a second virus involved. We did some uh, nanopore sequencing where we looked at a metagenome of all of the viruses in some of these samples. We initially found a Bermuda grass latent virus in some of the samples. It was later confirmed that that was contamination from Bermuda grass that was also infected with sugarcane mosaic virus and this Bermuda latent virus. So additional research uh, has shown that the second virus, Bermuda grass latent virus, does not actually play a role in LVN. All we need is sugarcane mosaic and the Floratam genotype, and we can see, again, death of the Floratam and loss of, of lawns. So to kind of summarize there, mosaic, the disease has a patchy distribution. It's, a, it's around the state. LVN is confirmed in the southern parts of the states. What we need to do when we suspect mosaic or LVN is test the suspect lawns through the clinic. You can send samples to the Plant Diagnostic Center in Gainesville. The Trek Lab has also done a lot of samples from South Florida and Miami-Dade and, and others. Um, and or send PICs via your local county extension faculty or direct to one of the labs for us to evaluate. If we know where you are in the state and what community, and we look at the pictures, a lot of times we can give you a pretty uh, confident diagnosis by picture and by knowing that you're in one of these affected areas. It's a, a very destructive disease to Floratam and it can't be managed with fungicides or other inputs. Uh, and so it's important for us to know when it's there and have alternative options for uh, homeowners and, and landscape managers that are dealing with it because it's not a very um, comfortable conversation to have that this lawn is not curable, it must be replaced, and it's even more uncomfortable when it's been replaced with Floratam and dies a second time. So we've done a lot of uh, work with county faculty in Palm Beach County. They've been excellent. Bill Shaw just retired and Lori Albrecht has been uh, uh, excellent as well as far as uh, dealing with landscape professionals, homeowners and HOAs, uh, and all the way up to, to sod installers and producers. So it's been a real concerted effort in Palm Beach County and, and uh, the east coast of Florida anyway, to, um, to deal with this and to push, push out as much information as possible. We've had some good programs in Hillsborough County as well. Uh, educating folks what it looks like and what we can do about it. So uh, in, in really short order here, what we know and what we've been saying about this uh, virus and, and management options is that like all viruses, it multiplies and lives inside diseased plants and it has to be spread in moist plant sap. So one of the ways that we're trying to combat this is to limit the moist plant sap transfer from one property to the next. Now mowers, uh, no matter who's doing it or how, are going to create plant sap on those blades, on those wheels, on the footsteps of the person pushing it, and they're gonna move this virus from plant to plant locally. What we need to try to do is to try to prevent the moist sap from getting into plant in a new community, in a lawn that's, that's uh, separated physically by um, some distance. The virus doesn't survive long outside the plant or in dead plants or dead plant parts. So um, it also doesn't affect palms, ornamental plants or pets or people or wildlife. Get a lot of concern when someone walks out into their lawn and they see this devastating disease kill the Floratam and they get concerned uh, for their pets, for their, for their selves and for wildlife. This is only a disease that affects uh, grasses, which is good. And it's only some grasses and only kills Floratam uh, and, and very, very closely related varieties to Floratam. So managing moist plant sap um, is, is the key. What 
folks have done that are mowing lawns that are affected is to allow their equipment to dry. Sanitizers can be used as well and are recommended in some situations. Um, application of sanitizer is allowed to dry that kills virus, according to the label, uh, has been done in some communities and it has slowed the spread somewhat in some cases, but hasn't stopped it. So moving fresh plant material around on mowers um, is, is the way that it moves plant to plant, lawn to lawn uh, that are touching. If we see jumps of this into a new community, what we've uh, associated that with is aphid feeding and the aphids are not particularly problematic on St. Augustine grass as far as perennial large population issues, but they are occasional feeders. And when they feed on St. Augustine grass that's affected with sugarcane mosaic virus, they can transmit it over a long distance because they're airborne and fly, not well, but they fly um, into a new community or area. And that's been the case in areas even where the mowers have been sanitized and where great care has been used to try to uh, prevent spread of this virus from occurring. So we haven't been able to stop it. We haven't been able to cure it. We have developed management recommendations that include using a different grass. And there are some challenges there as well. Household bleach and alcohol-based sanitizers are some, some that are being used. Uh, Lysol and other uh, products that are labeled for killing virus can also be used. You have to be careful with our wastewater that we generate. We, we um, have environmental concerns there. We can't wash it down the, uh, the drain, the, the storm sewers. So we have to be careful there. And what we found is that allowing the equipment to dry is just about as, is just as effective, kills the virus on that, uh, on that um, equipment and prevents it from being moved from one account to another. Other questions that I'm asked about this problem, is it spread by irrigation water or in soil and, and, and or airborne? No, it's, it's not. The virus has to be in plant material or insect vector. Uh, the aphid is the vector that we know of and it's not particularly efficient or this problem would be much more widespread than it is. So it's not a very efficient vector, but it can move in rare cases, uh, in rare events, longer distances by a, the aphid movement. Should clippings be removed from affected lawns? No, uh, leave them on the lawn, allow them to dry out, remove them from equipment. When we're going between lawns, that allows for the equipment, sap on the equipment to dry more quickly and reduces the chances of moving the virus from one community to the next, from one account to the next. For homeowners and for landscape managers, the recommendations that we're giving are, are do not regrass with Floritam. Uh, there are currently two varieties that have some genetic purity assurance with them. Those two are Palmetto. This is uh, not a certification. This is a licensing of producers and, a, and it's a company's licensing efforts that has uh, ensured that Palmetto is likely to be the Palmetto genotype when you purchase Palmetto sod from a licensed producer. Citra Blue is a new variety from UF that we're still evaluating. It does not die from LVN either, just like Palmetto. Uh, so far, those two have been excellent when we put them into lawns that have died from Floritam, uh, that were Floritam that died from LVN. They've produced um, high quality lawns when they're, they're properly taken care of. Uh, they do have downsides in Citra Blue. This downside is that it's new. And so we're cautiously optimistic. We're recommending it in small plantings and, and, and trying it out. And so far it's, it's performed well. Citra Blue is certified uh, at the uh, foundation level. It's a new variety. And so if you buy Citra Blue, you're gonna pay a premium for it and you're gonna have some returns of genetic purity. If you go out and buy sod from other sources that is not licensed or that is not certified, then uh, chances are because Floritam is so successful within the state, you're gonna have a chance that that sod will contain a percentage and even a high percentage of Floritam genotype within that mixture of sod gra uh, grasses within the sod product. If that's the case and you purchase shade grass or lawn grass or something else that's marketed under a name but has Floritam genetics, it will die and have to be replaced again. Um, and so what we're doing is, is uh, recommending Palmetto, cautiously optimistic and recommending Citra Blue uh, in those areas, again, that are affected and that we've lost lawns due to LVM. As far as what we do about the pre, um, as far as the uh, site preparation, 
herbicide to remove weeds and weeds, shaping, irrigation audit, manage pests and agronomic inputs carefully. The same best management practices that we have for establishing a St. Alex Stinging Lawn with or without the virus apply. The only difference is there's nothing to spray to the soil to kill the virus or anything like that. The only difference is to use a grass that's not or them when you replace that sod. This is a lawn in, in, the, in Pinellas County. That is Palmetto. It has the virus. It produced the very nice lawn. Um, and uh, that grass does not suffer from the virus like the Floridam does. <clears throat> Lawns in the same community, just a few houses down that were resodded with Floridam, do suffer. And this is what they look like after a year. So it's more quick, quickly declining and dying the second round and the third round if we don't recognize that this is a viral disease that affects Floridam and use something else. Uh, for landscape maintenance folks who are telling them to keep the virus out of your accounts, you don't want to be known as the person uh, that's spreading this. Don't mow grass when it's wet. Moist plant sap spreads the virus, so allowing the grass to dry uh, is, uh, is one way to prevent spreading it. Limit the movement of equipment from positive areas. If you know you have communities that you're mowing, that you're managing, that have the virus, do those last. Sanitize between movement of different communities, your equipment, or allow it to dry overnight before you move to, to a community that is not known to have the virus. And remove the clippings from the equipment at the account, leaf blower or some other method, broom them off. Get as much of the plant material as possible. And you can use a labeled sanitizer on tires, decks, and blades. Um, again, this is not prevented spread locally, but it can help us to prevent spread from account to account or from community to community. Also, allowing equipment to dry before starting the next account is just as effective and has fewer practical and feasibility issues with it. Allowing that equipment to sit and dry is, uh, is what most folks are doing. Getting it confirmed is important, again, as I mentioned, for PCOs because we don't want to be pouring money into these lawns that are suffering, that are dying. They will have other diseases present, including fungal disease. You can treat those with fungicide or other inputs, but it won't help. It won't stop. The outcome, which will be that that, uh, that grass will, will die. So uh, county office or, or me as the extension turf specialist for rumor control and for questions. And, uh, and again, um, uh, you know, get it confirmed. And then when it's time to replace that lawn, replace it with something other than floor tan. For sod growers, again, we haven't seen this lawn sod farm. So I'm asking them through the Turf Producers Florida uh, collaborations that we have to educate their growers and their employees, have a protocol for decontamination if they're selling into areas where this is a, a problem, dispose of the rip out material or the, the, the cast off uh, off farm, don't bring it back and consider limiting customer installer traffic in, uh, in production areas. So those are some of the um, things that we've, that we've come up with for management recommendations. They're, they're working well. It's a uh, real headache of a problem for folks to deal with in South Florida. And uh, it's one that hasn't gone away and is not likely to go away. Continues to spread and is one that we're continuing to look for new and innovative management strategies for. But it looks like at this point in those communities that are affected, Floritan is being removed as an option for turf for us. Um, there are non-turf options certainly for lawns where folks want a turf lawn. We're going outside of the St. Augustine grass species or again sticking with palmetto or citra boot. I'm going to pause there and ask uh, Jen if there are any questions that we want to address now before I move on and uh, kind of quickly go through in the last uh, time remaining here two fungal diseases that are more familiar to us, I think, and that uh, uh, see if we have any questions there. Sure, just a, a couple of questions. Um, does the Southwest Florida Research and Education Center uh, located in Immokalee provide a, diagnos a diagnosis service that is independent or is it tied to the diagnosis center located in Gainesville? So as I understand that we do have a, a clinic there, a lab there that you can bring samples into. Under normal, normal circumstances, they would um, process those samples themselves in extraordinary circumstances like we've been going through with the, the pandemic. We have received samples from the Trek Lab when they're closed down due to um, personnel issues or others and uh, from Immokalee when they're closed down. But for the most part, each of the individual labs under normal circumstances function individually. We have um, Dr. Romina Gazis in, in Trek. Um, we have uh, 
Pam Roberts and Immokalee and, and some others there. So um, yeah, those are individual labs and uh, under normal circumstances, they give you an independent diagnosis. We in Gainesville are known uh, and, and excel in turf grass because I'm the turf specialist and I'm located in Gainesville and work closely with the lab um, and small fruits again, because I work with blueberry growers, uh, but you can certainly use any of the labs in the IFAS system or outside the IFAS system for that matter. Okay, uh, you may have answered this, but how far north have you seen the SCMV? So it's interesting that the virus itself is common all the way up through the Midwest and, and the closest genetic relative to the virus we see in Florida causing lethal viral necrosis is actually an Ohio strain of sugarcane mosaic virus that affects corn. But uh, like I said, the virus may be spread all the way up through the Midwest and through the entire state of Florida, but the lethal viral necrosis disease development, the, the uh, death of Floratam has occurred from Vero Beach south and then from Pinellas, North Pinellas County, uh, again, south. We haven't seen that lethal viral necrosis further north than that. Okay. Uh, is fumigation effective to renovate an SCMV infected site prior to replanting Floratam? So, no, fumigation is generally not recommended for site preparation on a, on a lawn and uh, a landscape situation. Um, you know, fumigants can be difficult to, to use. They can be difficult to get clearance for in, in residential areas in particular. On top of that, they don't work to, to completely prevent reintroduction of the sugarcane mosaic virus back into, uh, back into the lawn. We have, I have worked with a couple of very high-end uh, large properties in the Keys where they did some fumigation hoping to, to do that, but it, it didn't work. The virus did come back. It survived again in propagules of, of host material in that soil below the, the reach of the fumigant and also came in from, from uh, neighboring lawns or by aphid transmission from lawns uh, that, that were within somewhat close proximity. So no, fumigation generally not recommended um, because it wouldn't necessarily work. Does not okay. Work. That looks like um, that's all there is right now. Uh, you answered a lot of the questions as you went. So Okay, Got up, please continue. All right, good deal. Let's uh, switch gears and kind of quickly go through two of our uh, very important diseases, fungal diseases of turf grass in the state of Florida. Uh, take all root rot and, uh, and large patch. Take all root rot is a fungal disease that, um, that we see perennially in Florida. And within the last three, three to five years, we've had some, some interesting um, uh, problems that have shown themselves that were due to this disease, but also extreme environmental conditions. So in spring 2018, we had a lot of winter injury. We had a cold winter in, in northern and, and central Florida, and we saw uh, sod failures from sod that was installed in the fall through the winter period that occurred because of that winter injury and that had take all root rot. Spring 2019 had a pretty severe drought period. After some initial rain, it dried out. And, uh, and again, we saw sod failures that were associated not only with this disease, but with the extreme environmental conditions. And so even where folks have employed fungicides and other management options, they, uh, we got many calls where those, some of those lawns that had been installed in that fall to winter timeframe failed. And uh, yes, they had the, the fungal disease, but, um, but again, uh, the main issue was environmental conditions. And we see that year to year. Uh, we see that with Zoysia grass, with St. Augustine grass, with our other Florida lawns and lawn grasses. Uh, when we see a sod installation in the fall, uh, we have to be very careful about our, our irrigation practices and hope that we don't see extreme cold temperatures after that installation. Um, I think it's a little better to wait until spring or early summer to make those installations of sod um, just because we don't have that risk of low temperature injury. It can be done in the fall, but we have seen an uptick in the number of sod failures uh, due to that. Take all root rot can uh, certainly further reduce turf grass quality and worsen symptoms during drought stress as well. Each year that we have a wet period in the spring and then a slight dry out sometime during the summer, our sample numbers will go through the roof of lawns that are failing, that are um, being grown in wet conditions when the favors the fungus and, and root decline, but the turf is otherwise getting enough water. 
And then that dry down results in those compromised roots failing in that sod uh, dying. What that means is that with take all root rot in that sort of scenario, the damage has been done and there really isn't anything we can do as far as managing that disease um, at that point. We're gonna lose some turf and have to re reinstall that in most cases. The, the severity of which is gonna vary by environmental condition, where you're at and what grass you're growing and how severe those, those uh, stresses were. So take all root rot is a disease that, that basically takes the roots of the plant and prevents them from taking up water and nutrients. When we have cold temperature injury, that take all root rot also depletes the carbohydrate reserves of the turf and makes that turf more susceptible to cold temperature uh, death and decline like we see in this picture here. This turf is suffering from take all root rot. It also suffered uh, back a few years ago in Gainesville from cold temperature injury. And so the areas that were exposed to the cold temperature and had the fungus died. Those that were exposed to the cold temperature but didn't have the fungus were able to survive. Um, the care of the turf and the, the level of stress on the turf going into that environmental stress determined how severe that injury was. So it's a combination of environmental and disease stress, further illustrated by this picture where we see someone who didn't follow recommendations as far as fertility, uh, and going into the fall of the year, this lawn was um, had some overuse of fertilizer going into the November time frame. It looked great going into November and, and Thanksgiving, but then when the cold temperature hit, that turf was not prepared for the cooler temperatures. It was more severely impacted. And yes, it had take all root rot and the gamanomyces pathogen that causes it, but it was not the primary issue that was um, that killed the turf. This lawn on the right received the appropriate amounts of fertilizer, reduction in fertilizer going into the fall of the year, and, uh, and also has take all root rot, but didn't die from that. So these things go hand in hand. We have to reduce the amount of, of stress that we inflict upon the lawns uh, in order for us to be able to manage that turf um, and manage the disease to a level that is acceptable, that doesn't kill the turf grass in our lawn. There's a different look at that lawn. Again, this is due to what was done to the lawn prior to the cold temperature, more so than the presence of that fungus. We need to separate those two because uh, we have options that we can employ for managing the fungus. Most of those are used on golf courses. This turf disease affects golf course turf as well, and primarily putting greens. This is where our fungicide use makes the most sense, where we have high intensity management of turf and, uh, and low tolerance for, for disease issues. The same sorts of symptoms are, are seen with thinning and declining turf grass and yellowing um, of the turf due to, again, the roots rotting and being um, dysfunctional, not able to take up the nutrients and water that the plant needs. If we pull up some of that, that St. Augustine grass turf, it's affected with take all root rot, we'll see lesions on the stolons. We'll see roots that are not holding on to soil that have a mushy exterior cortex that sloughs off very, very easily. Uh, this is indication that we have a root rot. When we look at that under the dissecting microscope, we can see the fungus that causes it. This is the sort of thing we'd like to be seeing, white roots holding on to soil, lots of root hairs, and a healthy turf up above. If we use the dissecting microscope on that disease turf sample, there can be a lot of different reasons for root rot, overwatering, other pathogens, but for gamanomyces, what we look for are little black shiny dots on those stolons that are indicative of the fungal pathogen gamanomyces. Under the compound scope, we can make out a better definition of those little puzzle piece shapes. This is what's diagnostic for us in the clinic or for you in the shop if you have a dissecting and compound microscope. You can see this on those stolons associated with that rotten root symptom and that thin and decline. Let's talk very briefly about fungicides. In, in essence, they don't work particularly well in the home lawn situation. By the time we see symptoms show up, we are too late for fungicides to be efficacious. We can certainly put them out and we are not likely to be um, happy with the results that, that uh, we get from that investment. So what we can do is reduce stresses by following IFAS fertilizer, mowing, irrigation, and other agronomic recommendations. If we give the turf the best care we can, if we follow common sense rules for when to use fertilizers and how much, uh, we can prevent stresses and prevent turf loss from this fungal disease. 
Disease turf does require extra care when we know we have disease occurring in a lawn. Uh, to maintain that quality, we need to recognize that the turf roots are compromised. They need less water, but maybe a little more frequently. And, and the same goes for fertilizers. We can't put out a pound of available in and expect that that compromised root system is gonna be able to utilize it. We have to go to something more uh, smaller amounts, slower release, and, uh, and not stress the turf grass with what we're doing to try to manage that uh, turf lawn. As far as different turf grass varieties, we do see differences in the way that some of those, um, uh, some of those react. Citra Blue, one of the new releases, does pretty well with take all root rot. It does better than Palmetto and about the same as Floratam. Floratam um, can certainly get the disease, but it's been persistent within the, the, uh, the, the uh, landscape. Soil tests can really tell you a lot about the lawn and its condition. We know high soil pH favors disease. This is generally more of an issue that we can address on golf course putting greens and, and home lawns. Um, but if we know that that's the case, we can be prepared for it. Again, I mentioned spoon feeding grass, so reducing the amounts of nitrogen that we're using when roots are compromised. The amount that we use all at once needs to be divided up into smaller applications. There's been a lot of research done on other diseases caused by other gamanomyces. Um, and so this is where some of our recommendations come from. Uh, I'm gonna show this picture of the graph of some of the varieties. This is turf grass quality on an inoculated trial of gamanomyces. And this, this guy up here at the top is our new variety, citra blue. It's done fairly well compared to some of the others where we have a turf quality of six to seven. That's acceptable and pretty good considering this was in a shade structure and was inoculated with the pathogen, uh, copious amounts of the pathogen to try to get it to decline. So it did decline, but again, it did better than some of our other varieties uh, and some of the accessions that will never make it to variety status because they have susceptibility to take off root rot. Here we have disease severity in that same trial. Citra blue came out down at the bottom. It's fairly resistant to take off root rot as well as the uh, gray leaf spot and large patch as well. So um, it's um, important for us to consider. Right now though, Citra Blue is new um, and Floratam is still an excellent choice outside those areas where LVN is, is active. Uh, we're cautiously optimistic in recommending Citra Blue in small areas. Hopefully those trends uh, remain. Research is ongoing for biological control. That research is um, uh, showing that we have some bacteria in the soil that can inhibit the black growth of the fungus. Max Duncan did a research project in my lab on this and, uh, and basically found that there's some potential there, needs a lot of additional research to, uh, to make that uh, an option for us that we can employ. I'm not gonna talk a lot about the uh, fungicide efficacy. I will mention Heritage is one of the products that we can use. The best time to use it in a home lawn situation is at the time of sod installation, when we know that we've had a lawn fail in part due to Bermuda grass decline. Fungicides can help us to reduce the likelihood that that sod will fail a second time when used at the time of sod installation. And we get statistically significant reductions using Headway or Armada. These are products that we recommend in our diagnostics and through emails and conversations with folks dealing with Comanomyces. But again, only when we do that at the time of sod installation and preventively, when we know the disease is likely to occur, it's occurred in that lawn in the past, and we're trying to prevent it. So uh, we do have active ingredients and, and products that are registered for use in residential lawns. Um, we need to keep in mind what our expectation should be is to prevent disease and help us to have a successful sod install after disease, not a curative addressing a disease that's already in progress and showing symptoms. Armada and Headway are two that we recommend. They have two active ingredients in there and those have been the best in my trial work. Um, uh, moving forward. So they are out there and available for us. They're expensive. I don't recommend homeowners to do them themselves because it takes some specialized equipment and knowledge, but there are the few occasional homeowners that have that determination and, and can do that. They can purchase them. I always recommend that they consult a professional though. Okay, I'm going to pause there and actually it looks like we're about out of time. So I'll take uh, uh, any additional questions and I can stay on a little later uh, to address questions specifically about large patch, about ornamental diseases, about the uh, gamanomyces and take all root rot that I just, I'm going to decline that I just talked about. 
Um, I'll turn it back over to Jen, see if we have questions in the Q&A. Sure. Are you finding ProVista prone to take all root rot? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you. Do you can ask that again? Sure. Are you finding ProVista prone to take all root rot? Oh, ProVista, yeah. So that's a Scott's release, a new, um, a new grass that um, is uh, closely related to Floratam. And so it has a lot of the same characteristics of Floratam. Um, and as far as the, the um, pretty good disease tolerance, it can certainly get take all root rot just like Floratam can. Uh, it's a, it's a, got similar, uh, from what I've observed, disease resistance as far as gray leaf spot goes to Floratam and large patch. Um, so Floratam is fairly resistant to large patch, so is, uh, so is Provista. Uh, the Provista grows a little slower, so recovery may be an issue. If you do have disease issues that come in and, and cause some thinning, it grows a little slower, um, which is a good thing. You don't have to mow it as often. And it has the glyphosate resistance, so it has the, the uh, option for weed management there that we don't have for other grasses. But uh, specifically for take root rot, I would say it's about the same as Floratam. can certainly get it, um, but uh, is not, not uh, extremely more susceptible or less susceptible. Okay. Uh, you mentioned cold temperatures um, a few times. What do you consider a cold temperature? Yeah, so warm season grasses are not happy below 55 degrees Fahrenheit. They start to okay. uh, shut down. They start to break down their chlorophyll, turn brown, and, and try to store that chlorophyll as carbohydrates. Uh, if we reach that 55 degree temperature um, in a slow succession down from a, from a warm temperature, the plant can prepare itself and, and can um, mm -hmm. evacuate that chlorophyll and turn brown, but it's perfectly healthy and that's a natural thing for it to do. Where we see damage, we see two things that, that uh, play into um, how much damage we see and, and uh, at what temperature we see that damage. And one is the condition of the plant prior to the exposure to that cool temperature. If we have a grass that's hardened off, it's not juvenile in its growth, it's received appropriate amounts of fertilizer according to timings recommended by IFAS, then we see that that grass uh, can harden off itself, it can stop growing, and doesn't generally um, show disease or show cold temperature injury uh, in the conditions that we see through the adaptation range of St. Augustine grass, so through the, through the panhandle. Um, but where we see problems is, is when we have uh, grass that's been over fertilized or over watered. And then two, when we have swings in temperature that are wild that go from 32 degrees and up to 75 down um, very quickly. Those can uh, result in grass that's um, not ready for the cold temperature, then that temperature which it might otherwise be able to approach slowly and survive, we see that damage and, and uh, reduction in quality. Uh, so those are the two most important things. And then the third thing I'll mention is that you know if we have some other stress in addition to the cold temperature, we can see a lot more severe issues. And take all root rot's a prime example. We see those patches die, not because of just the take all root rot, but because of the combination of that stress caused by take all root rot and that cool temperature exposure. Okay, um, you've mentioned also too much fertilizer. What is considered too much fertilizer? I'm assuming you're talking about IFAS uh, recommended rates. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's um, my colleagues in, in agronomy have come up with recommended rates. Those are continually ad adapting and evolving to um, the changing climate in Florida, but it depends on where you're at within the state and what grass you're growing. Um, we have uh, pretty comprehensive recommendations for nitrogen amounts that are, that are recommended and what times of the year that grass can use that nitrogen to build carbohydrates and to, to build uh, uh, the turf grass canopy and, and structure there. So um, those are available through EDIS and, uh, and are going to vary again by where you're at in the state, mm -hmm. what your level of, of management is, and, uh, and what or species and variety you're, you're dealing with. Okay. Uh, does application of potassium help with the general health of grasses during the cold weather? Yeah, so potassium is a good um, uh, thing to add, particularly when you're deficient in potassium and when you're expecting stress. Stress um, can be mitigated by applications of potassium, but it, the most uh, 
obvious effect of that are where we have potassium deficiencies. If we have sufficient potassium in our soil to begin with, additional applications are not going to hurt anything, but they're not going to give you as drastic of a, um, of a response. So that soil test can, can help you to establish you know, what, your, what your level and, and tissue tests can help establish what the level of potassium is and whether or not it's likely to occur. If you do have a deficiency, then a one-to-one -one ratio moving into the cooler temperatures of N to K uh, can and has been shown to help reduce the, the effect of that cold temperature stress on uh, warm season turf grass. It can help okay. if it's deficient and if it's done um, at that time. Okay. Uh, should we limit all fertilizer going into the fall or just nitrogen? So nitrogen is, is, um, is the big one. Um, if, if we are talking about potassium, we can, we can certainly use potassium moving in. Again, like I said, if it's, if it's deficient, that's going to give you the most, um, like the greatest likelihood for, a, for an effect. Uh, as far as phosphorus, you know, we don't add phosphorus to, to turf in Florida. We just rarely ever would need it, uh -huh. maybe in, in a seedling establishment sort of thing or a sod farm. But, um, but yeah, primarily I'm talking about nitrogen fertilizers. Micronutrients can also be used. Um, there's not a lot of data evidence suggests they, they um, do a lot on their own, but certainly that soil test can tell you if you are deficient in something that can help improve turf quality and, and those can be made other times of the year as well. Okay. Uh, can takeoff root rot be reversed with the BMPs? Can it be reversed? Um, <clears throat> you can have a lawn that is affected with takeoff root rot. And if you give that lawn, as far as BMPs go, the, the appropriate amounts of nitrogen, water, um, as far as the recommended mowing height, you can have recovery occur. You can have that disease be present and not cause significant losses of turf and turf quality. Uh, so yeah, I'd say doing the, the most you can in uh, the vast majority of situations where gamanomyces is present, you won't get disease elevate to the point of, of turf loss. Uh, there are exceptions there that occur when things outside of your control, like the weather, drainage on the site, uh, chemical, uh, for instance, herbicide damage that might occur, stress that turf and then the BMPs uh, again can help reduce severity but and, and likelihood of disease but it might not necessarily be able to prevent it and or recover from it completely at some point um, you know it becomes a matter of how long can you wait for that turf to recover how long can you wait for that grass to grow back into those areas where it's died from and um, and that becomes a you know, an issue for the homeowner and for the homeowner association a lot of times uh -huh. as to how much they're willing to allow that to sit there and grow back. It will grow back, but um, in the shade or in uh, areas where you, you don't like seeing bare areas, uh, it just may not be an option that's, that's palatable for the homeowner or the associated folks. Okay, let me see here. Large patch, should this be just left to run its natural course on St. Augustine? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, in most cases, like with Floritam, large patch does not cause a lasting issue. We can kind of let it go, run its course. Um, if we're talking about, and Citra Blue is similar, if we're talking about Palmetto, if we're talking about uh, Raleigh, um, it may be a different story. It also depends on the particular location that we're seeing the disease and how conducive is it to disease development and severity. If we have a wet low area um, or if we have a lawn that's got a lot of thatch in it, like the one in this picture here, uh, this one would really benefit from a fungicide application in the fall of the year. Uh, here, letting it run its course really significantly reduces the, the, the quality of that lawn. It allows weeds to grow back in. This is my neighbor's lawn. <laughs> And, um, you know, this year he has got very little disease. Uh, he's still, it's a little bit too thatchy. There's a little bit too much nitrogen being applied, I think, throughout the year. But, um, but this year, he, his lawn care company did put out a preventive fungicide. So he's got much less disease that's active, and uh, he's less likely to have to do those herbicide applications and whatnot uh, in the spring to try to get the lawn back. So it depends on how severe it is. And, and um, I will say also that it can increase over time and kind of build up in a particular lawn or landscape where uh, you see it. So allowing it to go 
Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to spray with fungicide, but uh, trying to address other issues like the timing of that nitrogen, the, the mowing heights, et cetera, um, can, can I think help to, to reduce that um, chance that it's gonna keep getting worse and eventually lead to a, uh, a problem you have to address. Okay, um, finally, can you please share your contact information for questions? Yes. Get this up here. And this should be. All right, can you see that then? Yes, we can. Okay, so my email is pfharman at ufl.edu. Uh, Twitter at Turf Doctor Man is my uh, sign on there in Twitter. And then we have a Facebook page also, UF Rapid Turf is our um, the search term you can use to find that. Um, with everything going on, we have been pretty, pretty slow, I'll admit, to reply to some of these uh, social media. Email is probably the best way to get a hold of us. And if you sure. um, uh, go through your county faculty first, that's always appreciated and it gets them in the loop. And and they're really good in Florida. We, we have a lot of uh -huh. uh, great faculty that can help us with the majority of our issues, but when they need my help, they know how to get a hold of you as well. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Try your uh, local extension. Um, for people who are wondering, this uh, has been recorded. It will be available on the FFL website, uh, floridafriendlylandscaping.com, under resources, and then under webinars. So um, you'll be able to access that probably about three weeks from now. Um, uh, any, anything else you'd like to add? No, if, if there are other questions, I'm happy to take them. Um, otherwise, um, we'll be here at the Plant Diagnostic Center. If you need us, reach out. Happy to help with, um, with your plant disease needs, both in turf, ornamentals, or anything that's green. Great. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And have All a right, great thanks. rest of the day. Thank you. You too. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye.